Welcome everyone. I wanted to start with a quick moment of gratitude to each of you for setting aside an hour of your day to join us. Thousands of you across the world are tuning in each week to hear and learn from CASEL and expert leaders on a range of topics related to social emotional learning. So thank you so much. Today, I'm joining you for, from outside, which is appropriate because you'll be hearing today from experts who will be talking about the power of play. We often underestimate just how important play is and the critical learning that happens through play. And even during this unusual context that we're living in, there are significant opportunities for children to explore and process their emotions and learn about and engage with others in positive and inclusive ways through play. I'm also extra excited today uh, because this actually marks our 20th segment in the Friday Castle Cares webinar series. And this series would not be possible without the incredible support from the Allstate Foundation. So today I'm thrilled to introduce Laura Frevoletti, Senior Program Officer from Allstate, who'll be joining us on screen just to say a few words. Hi, Laura. Hi, Melissa. Thank, thank you and the Allstate Foundation for helping CASEL provide this weekly platform for SEL to support educators, parents, and anyone who's interested in this work. We really appreciate Allstate's support. Well, thank you. And on behalf of the Allstate Foundation, we are so pleased to sponsor CASEL and this series. And how fitting that this is the 20th webinar. That's great. Uh, ensuring youth develop social and emotional learning skills is really the most important investment we can make for our young people. And in fact, for all of our futures. It's important to recognize SEL skills can be developed in a wide variety of activities from casual play to competitive and non-competitive sports programs to youth symphonies, bands, theater groups, and more. And it's an opportunity for all of us, parents, grandparents, friends, teachers, coaches, to teach and help youth practice SEL skills in multiple environments, from classrooms and playgrounds to dinner tables, to family rooms and backyards, even virtually, as we have done in the past several months. SEL has always been important for youth development and success, as you know, and 20 years of research shows. But it's especially important now as youth are navigating these extremely challenging times of a global pandemic, financial crisis, civil unrest, and more. The Allstate Foundation is a longtime supporter of SEL, and along with our nonprofit partners, CASEL, Playworks, Facing History and Ourselves, Inner Explore, and Wings for Kids, just to name a few, offer free digital SEL resources to help families and youth develop SEL skills. This year has turned so many lives up down, upside down, but SEL skills are key to empowering youth to be resilient, face challenges, and to flourish and succeed. In 2019, the Allstate Foundation made resources available for use at school and at home to help nearly 14 million young people navigate through everyday events and traumatic events to be in a place where they can learn and grow and set the course to achieve their hopes and dreams. That's something I'm very proud of. And I know the Allstate Foundation shares a goal with CASEL to see more than 25 million youth across the U.S. with SEL skills we wish by tomorrow, but realistically just in a couple years by 2022. We all have a role to play in the development of SEL skills for our nation's youth. Please join us in doing so. Thanks, Laura. And now I'm pleased to welcome CASEL's Senior District Consultant, Deidre Farmbury, who's gonna be leading our discussion today. Deidre is a career educator who began as a high school teacher and retired as an interim superintendent. And she's been working with us at CASEL for years, supporting partner school districts nationwide to implement systemic SEL. Welcome, Deidre. Thank you so much, Melissa. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I feel extremely fortunate to be able to say that I am at work, but I have been authorized to focus on play. I mean, how often does that happen? I have spent the past 24 hours 
reminiscing about all the wonderful play experiences and opportunities I have had throughout my life. And I have felt extremely blessed to be able to play just for the pure joy of it. But we know that there is so much more to play. Today's webinar will actually focus on some of the multi-dimensional facets of play. We're going to begin by defining play and really looking at the research base that supports play. Then we're going to be really thinking about, so what are the connections between play and our social and emotional wellness? That will be followed by some real practical examples of what does it mean for schools and communities to commit to play? What does it look like to be really strategic in including play intentionally into what we design for society? And then we will close out by really thinking about the disturbing reality of play disparities, which unfortunately prevent too many young people from experiencing all of the benefits of play. So we have a full agenda for the next 45 minutes or so. Again, I'm happy that you're here. So if you'll allow me to pull from some of my childhood play jargon, I am going to say, ready, set, let's go. And to help us get started, it is my pleasure at this time to invite Dr. Rebecca London to join me on screen. Greetings. Hi, Deirdre. Thank you, Rebecca, for being here. Thanks Rebecca, for you me. are an associate uh, professor of, psych of uh, sociology at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And I might add, you are the author of a book titled Rethinking Recess. So we're really looking to hear your expertise and the research base to help us understand with more depth the benefits of play. So my first question is, Rebecca, how do you personally, how do you define play? How is that backed up in the research? And then what are the social and emotional connections between play and our overall wellness? So that's a great question. Um, play is universally across the entire world how children learn. It's not just the key to children's healthy development. It is children's healthy development. And when we talk about play, we mean all different kinds of things, and it varies across you know, the age span. So very early childhood, maybe children are babbling, they're, they're playing through language. As they get older, they, they, they have better skills, fine motor skills and gross motor skills that allow them to do different things. So when we think about play, we think about kind of four different kinds of play. The first is physical play, right? Running, jumping, skipping. These are all forms of play and they develop gross motor skills, which are really important. Um, there's constructive play where we're building things, we're building towers, we're putting together puzzles, right? We're, we're, we're thinking about fine motor skills, we're thinking about cognitive development. There's imaginative play where we're creating whole new worlds that don't exist today or pretend play where we're mimic, mimicking our worlds, right? We're, we're playing school or we're playing you know, farm stand and people come up and buy things from us. Um, and then as kids get older, there's more formalized play. So play with games with rules, board games, soccer, um, any of the playground games that are, you know, tag that are out on the recess yard. So in schools, the, the time that play most comes into play um, is at recess, of course. And that's the, the one really unstructured time during the school day. And when we think about the importance of recess, it's because play and the interactions that happen through play are the ways that children learn and practice, especially practice their social and emotional skills. So think about it, You're, you and I are playing Foursquare. We have to decide who's gonna go first, mm -hmm. right? We have to negotiate, we have to collaborate, which of us is gonna go first, right? Then what happens? The ball goes out, or at least I think the ball goes out. You're pretty sure it was in. 
Now we have to resolve that conflict. We have to negotiate. We have to figure out how are we going to decide whether the ball is in or out. Okay, we figure that out. Turns out we agree the ball was in, so you're happy. The ball was at, was not out, and so I'm unhappy. I get kicked off the court. I got to go to the back of the line. And how do I self-regulate, right? How can I manage to control my emotions so that so that the game can go on and that I can jump back in when it's my turn, right? These are just a couple of examples, but through play and through recess, these are the ways that children are practicing these really important social and emotional skills in an unstructured way that just allows them to learn and grow. And it's essential. It's absolutely essential for their, not just their healthy social and emotional development, but for their healthy academic development also. Thank you. It's interesting because I thought about the self-awareness is that we understand through play and how, you know, there's always that child who feels, oh, I'm a lousy ball player. No one's going to choose me for the team. So, you know, just we do come into our own sense of our strengths and our developmental areas also through play. Um, so you talked about school districts that have eliminated recess. Now that we're in the period of COVID-19, so many districts are frantically talking about how do we make up for lost time? And I think there's a big concern about that pressure to make up for lost academic time is also going to reduce the focus on play even further, where, whether it's virtual play or those schools that are doing hybrid and going back. What would be your guidance to them about why they might need to rethink that if that's the direction they're heading? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, when I wrote the book, it just came out last fall, um, and I was talking about how to restructure recess and, and make it um, inclusive and make it a positive experience for everyone, make sure it's equitably offered. And then COVID hit and nobody's in school. Um, and when people, when you know, policymakers and educational leaders started talking about reopening schools and really focusing on that learning loss, those of us who study and advocate for play got concerned. Um, and even mental health professionals, the American Academy of Pediatrics, we got concerned because what's happening during this really unprecedented time is that all of us, not just children, but all of us are being exposed to unprecedented levels of trauma, of stress, um, some of us more than others. I mean, I don't want to downplay anybody's stress, but some people have lost family members and, and loved ones. Some families have um, lost jobs. They've become economically insecure or food insecure, housing insecure. Um, some people are living in unsafe um, situations with abusive family members or others in their household. We're experiencing as a society, and some of us are just lonely, right? We're lonely, we're isolated, um, we're separated from the people who, who we consider our, our closest supports. And so this trauma affects all of our bodies and our brains, and especially for children because their brains are still developing. There's a whole physiolog physiological response, I'm not gonna go into it, but it has to do with our hormones and our immune system. But basically it boils down to all this trauma and stress affects how children access the portions of their brain that they need for thinking and reasoning. So if you're sitting down to do a task and you're thinking to yourself, God, it's taking me twice as long to do this as it normally would, what's going on? That's because of this prolonged stress, right? It's difficult for us to really access those portions of our brain in ways that we're, we're normally, um, we normally do. So mental health professionals are concerned and they're calling for increased attention to play for children when they return so that they can socialize with their friends to really reacclimate to school. Um, and the American Academy of Pediatrics released some guidance and they put it pretty, pretty succinctly that schools should not focus entirely on learning loss when children come back, because what that can do is actually re-traumatize children. So if we focus on learning loss, which is of course very important, but to the exclusion of play and social and emotional skill building opportunities, what we can be saying to children is, we're not acknowledging your stress and trauma. We're not allowing you this time to reacclimate and heal um, and, to, and to reconnect with the people who you missed so much. What we're gonna do is throw you in classrooms and make you sit at desks six feet apart all day long and that's that. 
And that could be even more harmful to children than not bringing them back to school at all, frankly. So thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. I'm hoping that districts that are deeply engaged in their back to school planning are seriously going to take that advice into their um, planning efforts. Thank you. So with the foundational research and a better understanding of the social and emotional benefits of play, it's my time, my pleasure at this time to shift the focus a little bit to specific play strategies and how one district has been extremely intentional in including play in its strategic planning in terms of their holistic approach to young people. So at this point, I would like to welcome to the conversation, Jill uh, Violet and Michaela Gerardin Fry. Welcome, Jill and Michaela. It is so great to see you. Thank great you for here. being here. Thanks. So I'm gonna start with Jill. Jill, you are the founder of Playworks, a company that has been dedicated to helping schools be intentional in incorporating play into their design for how children spend their time um, and understanding that play is a key part of student social and emotional and academic development. So given that many districts are in the process of reimagining school, how might your framework help schools come back even better than before? Well, um, next week we are launching actually a the Playwork School Reopening Workbook, um, which is an effort to really uh, summarize and, and bring all into one place the learnings over the past 24 years of really making recess this great part of the school day. So looking at um, what are the lessons learned from how we have gone into schools and addressed the space and then helped um, develop rituals and rules and the sort of understanding of referees? How do you apply all of that in a way that helps translate the constraints of COVID into an, a learning environment where kids feel a sense of belonging and well-being? Um, and, and I think it's actually, uh, uh, Rebecca hit on it, at this moment, um, there's just so much uncertainty and incomplete information. And as humans, I think that pushes us to either want to like go into a room and make it all of the rules right away and just like be absolute or to stick our head in the sands. And, and with everything going on, not just COVID, but just the incredible uh, racial reckoning that's going on at a national level, this is a moment where play and, and the fact that it helps us to learn to manage our messy interdependence and really has survived evolution despite being a risky behavior precisely because it helps us sort of navigate these, these the complexities of social connection. This is a moment where making sure to, to bring in play so that we can design for both fear and joy represents our best hope for building a school system that actually addresses all the very pressing needs that are so present in this moment. Thank you. So given that there are so many parents and grandparents sitting home, probably agonizing over, you know, more months of uh, virtual learning, what would be your guidance to them about play when the well, child is at home or play yeah. in a virtual setting? So first off, I'd, um, I'd, as with all things, I'd advocate to start with empathy and gratitude, right? To lean in with so much kindness and love for the kids, for yourselves, for the educators who are trying to figure out how to like dance backwards and in heels. I mean, there's, it's, such a, um, it's such a situation where leaning in with love and understanding and, and having that be the thing you're shooting for above all else, like, to, give yourself a break in terms of thinking about what's going to happen with academic remediation in this moment. Like, there's so much we don't know. So the first thing I'd say is to start with kindness. And then a really practical way to do that is to play yourself. And Rebecca, you gave Rebecca such a hard task at the beginning defining play, right? It's one of those things that you know it when you see it. 
And there's a great definition of play as any, um, any activity undertaken for no apparent purpose, but um, a little bit of ease and le leaning in. And if you're cleaning up, making that a game, or if you're doing some work with a Zoom class or trying to sign in and you notice people getting frustrated, step away and like go outside for a second. I think going outside whenever humanly possible and, and bringing play into that is gonna make all the difference in the world. Thank you. Someone once told me that play is anything that you do where time flies and you weren't even aware that it was moving. Well, you so, said yeah, at, the start, at the start that your day, you know, getting to work and play at the same time. And I, I've made a whole career of this, which my children do mock. But I would say, too, there's a great Brian Sutton Smith quote that the opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression. Ah, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So we need to actively use play to get to avoid getting to that point of depression. And it's so easy to slip there, particularly now that we're experiencing this unprecedented quarantine. Thank you so much. So Michaela, um, your district, Michaela is the district social and emotional lead for the Washoe County School District in Reno, Nevada. And that happens to be one of our Castle collaborating districts. So Michaela, we have heard that your district is, has done so much in terms of being strategic in the inclusion of uh, SEL and play. So would you give us some examples, please, of how you infuse play throughout the day? And if I were to come to Washoe, what might I see as evidence? Okay, well, thank you, Deidre. I'm happy to be here. Um, I think that in Washoe, we've been intentional about embedded SEL across multiple aspects of the day. Academics, of course, but also throughout our PBIS systems, our family engagement, our disciplinary practices, uh, staff meetings, leadership meetings, and of course, play outside the biggest classroom. Uh, using our standards as a guide, we knew that for SEL to have a significant impact, it had to be in our schools both as an evidence-based program and curriculum, but also embedded throughout the day. Um, the curriculum at all levels gives students an opportunity to receive direct instruction, but also role play in each of the various curricula we have, while embedding intentionally throughout the day provides multiple exemplars and opportunities for students and adults to apply and practice their skills. Over the last few years, we've worked extensively with PlayWorks to give staff members the training and tools to not only create a recess designed on the principles of healthy play, healthy community, and inclusivity, but we also brought those tools and strategies into the classroom with joyful grouping strategies, transitions. The result is a classroom climate that is welcoming, it promotes equity of voice, inclusivity, of course, and sparks creativity. Uh, in, in anticipation for this upcoming school year and the need for play, many of our principals have already designed outside spaces to ensure play is still possible. There have been very intentional conversations among the leadership team and principals that students will need a break to play, to breathe more than in your typical school year. And in Washoe, our elementary school kids are going back on Monday. Uh, so this is a very interesting time that we are in. We know that this year will be an incredible challenge, but I feel hopeful that the whole child and the whole staff member will be at the forefront of our district conversations and supports. So we'll really be focusing on the well-being of, of our community. Um, Michaela, one of the things I did hear you say was, you know, you, you mentioned role play. Um, I'm a former English teacher. I have my students role playing all the time. <laughs> Um, but also you mentioned transitions. I'm wondering, how, how do you turn transitions into an opportunity to play? Well, it's just like Jill said, even cleaning up, you can make playful. So instead of from your desks to carpet, it is you are walking on the moon to the carpet. Like tiny little shifts in the way that we're looking at what we're asking students to do makes a difference in the climate, makes a difference in their willingness to be creative and to um, be a part of the classroom community. Can I interject there too? I just want to say about, about transitions. I just think um, transitions right now, it's always been a huge part of how PlayWorks figured out 
how do you set kids up to succeed, right? Yeah. So before you go out from the classroom to recess, you like talk about expectations, about the, you, you really um, lay it out as step-by-step step as possible. And we, we picked up that practice from working with kids who were um, in a program for kids with severe emotional disabilities, because what folks who work with kids on, on the spectrum know is that transitions are where things can break down the most, mm -hmm. right? So prepping them and then getting out. And then when you get out the, onto the schoolyard, circling up, reviewing what the rules are just quickly, and then you know getting people um, to the go play and then having various rituals, cheers and things to help with transitions. I, I just call it out because I think everything we've learned about helping kids through transitions in schools applies to helping all of us as a society in this moment of transition going from being out of school in COVID to like figuring out how do we do hybrid, the, the intent, the, the, the ability to which we can actually intentionally call out what's happening, communicate clearly about it, be kind, set expectations. I, I think all of us have experienced some level of trauma and um, what we know about kids who have experienced trauma is that having choice and voice and visibility into the process is a total game changer. All right, I care a lot about that. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. And and you know, anyone feel free to chime in. Um, I particularly love the idea of transitions because from what I've seen in so many schools, transitions seem to be the most joyless part of the school day. Um, I'm thinking about how so many students have to march in silence to the bathroom. Um, you know, there there's almost uh criminality around it. So the fact that there are ways to bring joy into moving through buildings, into moving from one place to another. And I also heard you speak very, um, very candidly about the need for expectations. I mean, play is not a free for all necessarily. There, have, there has to be expectations around how we're going to do certain things so that the learning can really occur and so that students can be really in touch with their social emotional development through play. So so I love the idea of really making sure that the expectations are, are really put in place. Um, Mikhail, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, so how did you get there? Um, what, what, what has been your district's journey in getting there? What has the professional learning looked like? Um, how have you heightened the expectation that yes, we do celebrate and expect play? What's your journey? Well, we have, I, I would say, like, we've been on this SEL journey since 2012, and we've gone through a few curricular programs. Um, currently, what I am working with at the elementary school is Sanford Harmony. Um, I'm loving it so far. So are all the staff. But almost every aspect of this curriculum has play infused, and it almost goes through everything, Rebecca, that you talked about, physical, constructive, imaginative, and then more formalized play built into the curriculum where they're building social emotional skills, but it can be infused in academics. So I would say that almost every aspect of what we do here in Washoe, whether it is the curriculum, our professional learning, it is always like, this is part of our priorities here. We will always have a way to welcome the community, whether it's a group of administrators or teachers or students, it is the expectation that there's always a welcoming or inclusive opening. We always have brain breaks or um, ways to, like when we talk about transitions, going from one thing to the next, making it something that's playful, energizing, or calming if that is what's need, needed, you know, centering. And then always at the end of what we do, we have a way to reflect. We offer um a, a moment minutes to reflect on what was learned in a day so that it can move into the permanent space for our students and our staff i mean these are the signature practices that are infused in everything we do from professional learning to um our training for our staff in terms of each period or morning middle of the day end of the day it's infused uh, throughout you know, Deidre, I feel like our transitions in this moment in schools are going to look a little different because a lot of them are going to involve hand washing, ah, right? Yes. There's going to be a lot of hand washing, going out, going in, going to lunch. And so um, I know Jill has a hand washing song. I'm not going to make her sing it right now, but, you know, <laughs> water, soap, bubbles, 
right? Think of all the opportunities involved in that for play. Uh, when one of my kids was in preschool, her preschool teacher would tell me, when we can't find her, we know she's in the bathroom playing in the sink. Um, because that's naturally, that's a, you know, kids love that. So just thinking about, you know, what's going to look different this year? There's going to be a lot of hand washing. How can we make sure kids are doing that long enough um, and making it not a chore, making it not feel criminal, but making it feel fun and an opportunity to refresh and be healthy, right? Yeah, I think, Rebecca, what you bring up, it sparked in my mind that transitions are, there are going to be more instructional minutes lost, if you will, to transitions this year more than ever. Um, I've already received information from my daughter's teacher on what hand washing is going to look like and when it's going to happen. And so teachers are getting creative, but I like the idea that we can also offer some strategies and songs, Jill, to help um, make it playful and make it so, you know what? We don't love this, but here's where we are, and we can spark joy even if we're washing our hands. And I don't for the. I think there's a way to think about and reclaim these moments of play and joyful singing. Um, and I'm not going to break into song, no matter how much you prompt me on this webinar. But like, how do you actually transition to act considering those moments instructional time, right? Because really, like, how do you flip it from a a have to to a get to, and that this moment of hand washing stops being about this onerous task that we have to do and becomes a way that we engage the students in considering how do we keep each other safe? How do we take care of each other? And it's really where COVID and equity issues and the, and the play as an equity issue really becomes so clearly connected, right? Because this is how you find out how to make sure that the least safe among us, the least comfortable, still have their needs addressed and that we all feel a collective responsibility for for each other that's that's the heart of sel yeah absolutely i think also in this time we i've been thinking a lot about this concern that our staff are feeling just as we've all experienced the same trauma we're all in the same storm we're not in the same boats right you've seen that that meme but um really giving teachers and administrators the permission to spend time on this saying this is the priority because we're in, we're in this heightened sense uh, when, when, when things are hot as they are. That's not our first instinct to say, let's go play. It's like, like you said, in, um, academic losses or, you know. So I think it's really, we must be intentional about saying you have permission to do this. It is vital we do this and we'll see everything come together um, if we can really prioritize our community and connections with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it really does necessitate a whole reframing of play. I'm thinking of all the phrases we've heard about play throughout our lives. Um, your waste, stop playing, you're wasting time, mm -hmm. right? Or people saying, um, you were disobedient, so you can't play. So play is punishment. Mm -hmm. um, or stop playing so much. And it sounds like it's just the opposite message that's needed now. Play more. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, play is not wasting time. Play will make you a better, stronger person to use time even better and, and in more beneficial ways. So there's almost a need to reframe the narrative that's been out there around play and to really highlight the importance of play, particularly now um, that COVID has people so distraught and wondering how we can survive this. And it sounds like play is a key survival strategy. Yeah. In normal I would say the principles, now. Deidre, sorry to interrupt you. I would okay. say the principles of play are what we're after, right? Like Jill and I have spoken, it's not about a program, it's about these principles. If if you are designing play that is on a principle founded on a principle of healthy community and inclusivity, that's a whole lot different than let's go play dodgeball and peg each other on the playground. <laughs> it's like it is totally different. You have the same winners. You can probably remember them from your fifth grade experience. You have the same kids on the side, same kids standing on the wall, not playing. So if we prioritize the principles and can teach those um, and make that a part of our norms within our classroom, uh, classrooms and our buildings, that's where we get healthy play and, and the good lessons, the social emotional skill building that is really portable forever. Yes, thank you for reminding us that 
we need to keep in mind the principles of play. What is it that we're ultimately trying to do through play? Thank you. So I would like to have us spend some time really thinking about some of the disparities and the inequities surrounding play in terms of aspects such as who has access to play, opportunities for play. Um, in some communities, the question of is it even safe to play? Um, are there differences about what play can look like depending upon race and gender and all those kinds of isms that contribute to inequity? So I'm inviting everyone to just contribute as you feel the spirit move you to some inequities, disparities around play. Well, as the sociology professor, I'll start um, okay. and then just and share what you've seen um, on the ground. But historically speaking, um, historically speaking, when we moved to a more um, uh, to a more standards based um, assessment um, where we were standardized testing came into play, right? We started to think, you know what? We really need more kids actually studying math and English during the school day, more minutes is going to help us do better on those standardized test scores. And then minutes for recess actually started going down and down and down. And there were some very large school districts, Atlanta, Baltimore, Chicago, that eliminated recess altogether for decades, for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and those were, of course, school districts that were serving, in some cases, majority, um, in Atlanta's case, majority Black students, um, students of color, low-income students, inner city students. So for the most part, districts have now brought recess back, but there's tremendous inequity in terms of the amount of minutes of recess that are available to students across the country. And there's also tremendous inequity in terms of policy, state policy towards recess. Very few states, the count is somewhere between 10 and 12 right now, have any kind of state policy around how many minutes per day children should have recess, although almost every state has policy on the number of minutes per day per week um, that students should have PE, physical, physical education. So recess isn't really even considered a vital part of the school day. In most places, it doesn't count towards instructional minutes. And so you're extending your school day in order to offer it. Um, and what we know is that recess is the most common punishment for children, for misbehavior, or even miss schoolwork. And again, we don't have good stats on how many and which ones, but we do have really good information on um, children who are disciplined in school, suspended and expelled. And what we know is the groups of children who are suspended and expelled at the highest rates are boys um, and boys of color, specifically black, native, and then Latinx boys. And so if we think these are the boys who are getting in trouble the most, they're also probably the kids who are being having withheld recess withheld the most, also children who are in special education. And, um, and what we're doing is we're setting up even more inequity. We're saying, you know, we know we've established on this call, play is like the most important thing for social and emotional skill development. We have some kids here who really need some social and emotional skills to be able to self-regulate in the classroom and be able to learn. And what we're saying is, too bad kids you can't access that time because you can't keep it you can't keep it together during class time and so you're not allowed to play and it's being used not just as punishment but also it's it's deprivation it's inequitable equitable deprivation of an opportunity for children to really build these skills thank you i would just jump in and add you know Dita, you're saying like all the things we say about play about um, you know, it's a waste of time. And, but, but if you look at who gets to play in America, it, it's pretty telling. I think fundamentally play is an equity issue, right? And who gets to play? And, and, it's, and it's basically, it's profound connection to building the skills that enable people to grow up and be engaged democratic citizens. Like, like that is how we learn to get along. It's how we learn how to self-regulate, how to to, um, to problem solve, all those SEL skills, they translate into citizenship. And, and I think when you think about the purpose of American education, that we have a public education system, not to raise factory workers, but to actually, you know, really educate the next generation of citizens who will help to ensure the future that we so desperately need, 
um, the, the, the play and the and the, the lessons learned through play, it just if we're going to have an equitable society, it has to be one where everyone gets to play. Yeah, Thank you. I was thinking my first question is always who has access. Right. So who has that when when they leave your classroom and go home, do they have access to play? Like those are the questions just as educators to be thinking about. Um, because as you said, Rebecca, yes, it's still being taken away. Recess is still being taken away, even though we've known for quite a while. That it doesn't solve any behavioral issues to take away a period of time where someone might be able to use some energy outside, burn some energy so they may focus. It's, it's still being used. But I think a really examining who has access to this outlet is a good first step for people to start thinking about um, which groups are being allowed and which groups are not. And it's it's easy to assume, well, if they're not getting play at school, they're, you know, they're getting it in their out of school time. And I think we know that there's inequities in um, access to play outside of school also, even thinking sports leagues, right? Sometimes they cost money. Sometimes they um, create inequities because kids have to be in certain places at certain times and transportation's an issue or parents are working and can't get their kids there. Kids are too young to go on their own. Um, in some places, there's not access to green space or even to low cost programs that children could um, enroll in, say at the Y or the Boys and Girls Club, right? There's a, there is a lot of inequality in access to safe and healthy space um, for children outside of school also. And so if public education is the great equalizer that we think it should be, um, then we need to ensure that we have equitable access to play in school if we can't control what's happening outside of school. Exactly. I'm also thinking about um, just the need to, again, help everyone understand the broader definitions of play so that when we think about students having access to play, we aren't thinking necessarily in the traditional ways like the sports teams and so forth. Um, the fact that there are cultural, you know, students who are in the orchestra, that's play, right? Students who are in jazz bands, that's play. The marching band, that's play. Um, and I think, Rebecca, it was you who talked about four types of play, the physical play, the constructive play, imaginative play, and formalized play. Um, and I think that a lot of people think that if they don't see equipment involved or if they don't see kids tagging each other or if they don't see kids running around, then it's not play. But when you really think about play through these four dimensions, there's so many aspects of what play is and just helping to raise everyone's awareness of what's play and then how can we make sure that all communities provide opportunities for all students to have access to access to the broader definition of what play is. And I just want to connect too. I think as you're describing that, just, I mean, just tying it up in a bow, how deeply connected that is to learning, right? So mm -hmm. just can't help it. I'm a little plain nerdy, but like there's another great definition of a game by philosopher Bernard Suits, that a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome an unnecessary challenge. And if you think about the voluntary attempt to overcome an unnecessary challenge, and if you think about what it takes to have the resilience to lean back in again on a math problem set that stymied you, or to think about what it means to take the risk to write an essay where you talk deeply about your feelings, or to learn how to you know, write your letters, or to be willing to draw and to you know, communicate visually, we ask, as grown-ups, we ask kids to be vulnerable in learning so frequently. Like that learning is this very vulnerable experience. And play just feels to me so foundational to giving kids the experiences that reinforce the understanding that most success is predicated on multiple failed attempts, right? That like, there's nothing like watching a kid who teachers have said is dismissed as being, you know, not dedicated, who will stand outside and take 9,732 efforts at hitting that one random layup. You know, it, it is finding relevance and um, connection for the kids and 
And really, what can we do to tap the intrinsic motivation and those experiences that make kids feel like they both belong, but that their efforts will result in change for the better, right? I mean, we all need that, so, no. Yeah, and I think, um, Jill, it was you who spoke about the connections between play and the development of citizens. I know there's so many schools, you know, a big focus is career and college readiness, but just making connections between play and careers, that what you're doing in the name of play and what you're, what you're developing in terms of your social and emotional capacities also help to um, lead you in a career, a better career path or a stronger route to a career path. So the connection between play and career. So it keeps going back to that rebranding of all of the benefits of play. And play and, and student agency. Like one of the things we see, and Rebecca wrote about in her book, and I've heard Michaela talk about it, but when you thoughtfully bring play into the schools and you put kids in charge, they become drivers of their own education in a profoundly different different way. And this moment, you know, Michaela talked to, mentioned it, this is gonna be so stressful for educators. And I think reminding people, teachers, they don't have to do this by themselves. And we don't want them to do it by themselves. We don't actually think it's possible for them to do this by themselves. That we're gonna to have to rely on each other. We're gonna to have to rely on the students to be people who help co-construct the new rules and take responsibility for making sure that they follow these rules and that they take responsibility for their peers. And we're gonna to have to engage families in a different way. Like a lot of parents are like ready to send their kids back, but like, they, wait, time out, you don't get to quit yet. We're still all in this together. And this moment where I think play just has so much to teach us about how we co-construct this new moment. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Well, this has been an extremely engaging discussion about play. Um, so any of us who came to this webinar thinking the play is something frivolous and fun, Yes, it's fun, but I would say it is not frivolous. There's a whole lot of depth in, t in terms of how play is designed, the connections to the social and emotional benefits of play, the citizenship development. So I really am so appreciative of all of your perspectives that have really helped us take our understanding of play to a new level. So at this time, I would really like to summarize some of the key takeaways. So Emily, if you'll put up the takeaway slide, please, thank you. So I think that one of the major takeaways is first of all, social, the social, emotional, and academic benefits of play make it a critical component of strategic school planning. It's not a second thought, it's not happenstance. It has to be intentionally designed and intentionally implemented because it is has to be a critical component, not an not a afterthought. Secondly, the existing inequities that deprive some young people of opportunities to play is a social justice issue. We've heard so much this summer about social justice and social justice marches and social justice issues. Well, the inequities around play are a social justice issue which in itself warrants a need for ongoing advocacy and action. Third, the elements of joy and fun in play help promote healing from trauma. So I think all of you spoke about the extent to which, particularly now in this coronavirus epidemic, pandemic, people are traumatized in so many ways. As you said, loss of family members and friends, um, loss of income, loss of jobs, just the struggle and the stress. So people are so traumatized, the question becomes, how can we make sure that play is used in a way to help people heal from their trauma? Again, it goes back to the intentional design and use of play for this purpose. And finally, play is fun. But we're hoping from this webinar you're taking away that it is fun and a whole lot more. So at this time, I would like to thank 
all of our panelists, Rebecca, Jill, Michaela, thank you so much for all of your guidance. I'm sure that there are districts and communities out there who are planning with a renewed understanding and hopefully a renewed passion for why we must intentionally include play. Um, for the families that are thinking about what can I do to make learning uh, more fun and different? Should my child be one of the millions that will be home again, still in in, engaged in virtual learning? Hopefully they understand that part of it is the importance of play, not only for the children, but also for the adults as they are struggling with this, uh, you know, split attention to parenting and doing whatever they need to do for their own career should they be home. So there have been so many great takeaways for, I think, all segments of the population. So again, I thank all of you for taking the time to share your perspectives with us. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks yes. so much for having me. Absolutely, absolutely.